Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thinny. Thinny. Yeah. yeah. Tano. Tano. Here. The internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for a review of the new Lingua Ignota record, Sinner! Get ready. This is a new album from singer, writer, and composer, uh, Miss Kristen Hater, aka Lingua Ignota. Her third album to date following the immense Caligula in 2019, one of the greatest and easily most shocking records of that year, which saw Hater delving into themes of abuse and betrayal against horrifying combinations of noise, classical music, and dark wave with a somewhat metal twist. So I'm still really enamored with this record, but but I don't know if my pitiful little soul could take another helping of Lingua Ignota music in such a short amount of time. I guess you could say this uh, sinner was not ready. Christianity and music of worship has played a significant role in Lingua Ignota's music since the release of All Bitches Die, and it's something I picked up on pretty quickly as a recovering Catholic. And I get a sense from her music and from her interviews that she is as well to a degree. But despite that, I greatly appreciate the way she's been able to balance these feelings of faith and awe with the destruction and fanaticism that often paints Christianity's past. Now, on past Lingua Ignota efforts, these religious themes and aesthetics have been there, they've been present, they have been very present, but maybe not the main focus. But on Sinner Get Ready, they take up so much more of the center stage. This new LP comes with a slight change in musical aesthetics, too. The classical instrumentation and vocal pageantry are still here in spades, but this time Hater is working in more elements of folk and neo-folk. Even the closing track seems like her own powerful and dirgy take on a church hymn. There are quite a few vocal snippets and recordings in reference to Christianity, or at least parts of it strewn about the record too. On the closing track, we get a woman talking to a CNN reporter about how she can't get sick from COVID because she's covered in Jesus's blood. There's a man recalling a hymn that his mother used to sing. Televangelist and all-around garbage person Jimmy Swaggart apologizing for cheating in front of his congregation. And not to insinuate this record is like some sort of Christian hate hour, it's not. Because there are moments of genuine beauty and I think spiritual transcendence throughout Throughout this record too. But there's a duality to Sinner Get Ready, and I think a lot of that push and pull centers around Hater's macabre attraction to Christianity. Throughout this album, you have feelings of extreme devotion and faith mixed with feelings of disgust and distress. And the opening track displays the love, but also the madness that can come from these extremes. Given dramatically sung lines like Sickness Finds a Way In, maybe even the ways in which organized religion can be perverted. The music on this particular track reflects that dichotomy too. As the first leg of it is a little brooding, but by lingua ignota standards, it's pretty bright and uplifting. One of the more euphoric passages of the record, with soaring vocal harmonies and rich piano chords, a wall of instrumentation that's building as high as the tallest reaches of a chapel ceiling. It's incredible. It's an amazing sound, but eventually this all comes crashing down with these chaotic, slamming, dissonant piano chords and booming hits of bass, plus lots of tragic opera style singing from Hater as well. It's a long but gratifying tone setter for the record that I think lets listeners know what exactly they're going to be in for. Like, if you're not vibing with this, you might want to turn back now. So yes, the start of the record is incredibly chilling, and I find this to be even more so the case for I Who Bend the Tall Grasses. This track is mostly centered around a very somber organ chord cycle that sets the stage for a vocal performance from Hater that not only calls on her singing chops, but her acting chops too, as she's playing out a scene that's similar to a lot of Bible tales out there, where you have a protagonist that is begging God for something, they are going through pain or sacrifice to prove their worth or their devotion. I have made my body your vessel, I preach your word in every room, I have walked the earth weeping, I have whipped my back with my sorrows, are my sacrifices not extravagant? She's doing anything to fulfill this spiritual relationship that in a way is thankless or it's one way and she's being driven to the brink because of it. Now, uh, the ask that she's seeking for from God on this track uh, is to intercede and uh, 
kill someone. And when asking for that, she kind of switches back and forth between uh, speaking with language that's in a more biblical voice or uh, just straight saying like, I don't give a fuck, I'm not asking, ah. But in this one scenario, in this one portion of the record, there is just like so much to dig out of the narrative and the language, considering like the toxicity and uh, the violence and obviously the negative uh, relationship and association she has with the person who she wants to die, but then also the ways in which uh, this is kind of mirrored and displayed in this weird relationship uh, with God that is uh, being described inadvertently through the dialogue and through the ask. And the desperation to get something in return for the sacrifice and the devotion. The Settling vibes turn more drony, chaotic, and acoustic on the following many hands, which feels like a twisted interpretation on a religious folk song of some sort, with lots of repetitious lyrics, building vocal layers. The instrumentation sounds pretty organic, but I love how the more cluttered and, I guess, uh, chaotic it gets, the more distorted it feels and sounds. And even though in comparison this track may not be as dramatic as the previous one, I find the lyrics to be uh, just as horrible with a sinner being told to get ready for the unforgiving arrival of God, and what happens after that arrival is not pretty. The following Pennsylvania Furnace I thought was a kind of mild teaser for this record, but believe me, after the first three songs, this relative breather is uh, very much needed. There are some gorgeous instrumental builds and resolutions on the back end of the track, but if you were expecting the lyrics on this one to brighten up, eh, not, not gonna happen. If you've consumed any of Hater's music to a fair amount up until this point and paid attention, paid attention to the details, you've probably noticed like loneliness and solitude are a recurring theme, and that's what this song centers around. Seems we're dealing with a protagonist here who has kind of accepted uh, the fact that they are going to be alone and they're wishing to, I guess, uh, die with their dog and end their life as a result of that. Me and the dog die together. Do you want to live in hell with me? I've watched you alone in the home where you live with your family. And all that I've learned is everything burns. That being said, I urge anyone listening to this track to not take it as a literal statement of intent or anything like that. I see it more as a hater telling a story of isolation and loneliness and then from the outside kind of identifying with those feelings that are occurring within the story. Now, for any big fans of uh, Catholicism out there, you may know that uh, repenting and confessing is a big part of that, and hey, that's what the next song is all about. In fact, it's maybe the most harrowing and ghoulish Appalachia folk-inspired song about it ever. And what God will do to you if you don't confess. Remember this body is not your home because, you know, it's just like a, a, a vessel that you're existing in until you transcend to the kingdom of heaven, obviously. Uh, oh, he will knock the breath from you. He will ram your eyes with glass. He will take your legs and your will to live if you do not confess now. Which of course all builds up the pageantry of the record that I was referring to to earlier, but it doesn't make listening to this any less uh, frightening, especially given some of the dark and sinister harmonies uh, strewn about this kind of droney track. Hater's uh, vocals on this one, the vocal layers, are absolutely nuts. I feel like I'm trapped in the American version of Midsummer, located uh, in like a rural mountain area in West Virginia. Now, the Sacred Liniment of Judgment, oddly enough, is another relatively bright spot on the LP. There's something kind of blissful about Hater's voice in the droning folk instrumentation on this one. I'd also like to note the repetition of this track and much of the album itself overall, which I think also ties so deeply into the influences coming from religious music in general on this record, as music of worship does tend to lean into repetition as a means of evoking this otherworldly madness in its listeners. It's repetition past the point of the music feeling like a piece or you're progressing through a composition. It's repetition to the point where whatever you're listening to feels more like a sensation or a presence. And there can be an incredible intensity to that which I think is effectively plugged into this record very well. Also the eerie use 
use of the Jimmy Swaggart sample on this cut ties pretty deeply into experimental rock bands like Swans or various neo-folk and post-rock outfits. I think this clip also speaks pretty greatly to the themes of infidelity and betrayal laced throughout this record, which also calls back to earlier Lingua Ignota work. The perpetual flame of Centralia is another gorgeous moment in the track list here, sonically and instrumentally a refuge of sorts in the way that Pennsylvania Furnace was, but lyrically it's kind of a refuge too, featuring Hayter singing about uh, being on a righteous path and knowing no fear because uh, she has faith in God, faith in Jesus. Overall, it's a super simple track with mostly just vocals and piano, some subtle instrumental flourishes in the second half. It's just gorgeous from front to back, very soft, very easygoing, but also with reference to the fires of hell burning dull and long, which is a clever callback to the title of this song, which is in reference to a town in Pennsylvania that I guess has had an underground mine fire burning since the 60s, and it's it's still going to this day. It's still going right now. They just kind of like abandoned the town entirely at one point and razed it to the ground in the 90s and 2000s. And just as a side note, I love the various ways in which the Pennsylvania area is kind of inspiring certain songs and lyrics throughout this record. Man is Like a Spring Flower is a moment on the record that I am slightly emotionally mixed on, but still so deeply in love with. The opening features Hayter singing with these really campy, sour vocal harmonies. I feel like these vocal passages are a necessary tension buildup to this really gratifying, beautiful, minimalist classical passage that comes immediately after after. Sounds like a Hans Zimmer piece or some shit with the way everything's like layering up and building. The vocal leads and layers that Hater lays into this section of the track are incredible and gorgeous and awe-inspiring as she is describing the heart of man as being impossible to hold with love not being enough to do that with one person not being enough to do that. Keep in mind this track also features audio from a sex worker that Jimmy Swaggart used to meet up with which uh, he got caught with that person and that's why he was apologizing in the first place in the earlier clip played on the record. But yes, this track is gorgeous, it's cathartic, it's tense, and also tragic all at once as this song feels almost like the final nail in the coffin when it comes to these themes of infidelity and betrayal in the lingua ignota canon. This feels like a final statement on this, and it's it's like, it, it is what it is. This is the heart of man in, in terms of, you know, my interpretation of it. This is my feelings on it. We then arrive at the hymn style closing track that I mentioned earlier, which is gorgeous and relatively another moment of solace on the album as Hayter describes a paradise being hers, reaching some point of closure. I like narratively what this track means for the record, but the selling point for me is really just the incredible gorgeous and harmonious vocal layers and horns throughout this track as well. I love the melody of it too. It kind of reminds me of one of my favorite hymns of all time, Abide With Me. But yeah, this track is just wonderful. It's gorgeously arranged. I honestly find myself just playing this one single song over and over and over just because of how uh, euphoric uh, the whole thing feels. But yeah, a lot of this record is, is about religion and deals deeply in religious themes, but Honestly, when you kind of dig beyond that, uh, a lot of this is brought up to express uh, emotions and feelings on a lot of the same deeper issues that were wrestled with on Caligula. Again, the betrayal, the infidelity, the abuse, and a host of other things. Which, mind you, is not a complaint. I actually like that Hayter was able to engage with these ideas once again from another angle, creatively, and do it in a way that, um, narrative-wise feels way more cohesive and consistent, and as a result of that, it, it comes across as more thorough. But yeah, I'm, I'm really just like massively impressed and in awe of this record in a multitude of ways. Uh, the production, the songwriting, the performances are all incredible, and the way they come together as a whole is something to behold as well. In a weird way, I felt like this record was a religious experience in and of itself, and like a religious experience, uh, despite the fact that I've been talking all this time, I have a difficult <laughs> Time summing it up and putting the whole thing into words. And maybe the easiest way to do that is to describe not what it is, but how it makes me feel or what I feel about it. And that's that I think it's beautiful, it's awe-inspiring, but it's also scary 
It reminds me of my size, my weaknesses, because I feel like I'm dealing with and listening to something that's much bigger than me, which I think will be the takeaway for a lot of people who choose to listen to this album and wrestle with it on its own terms. But yeah, I'm at a loss for anything else to say. I, I feel like I just have to give this a 10. Yeah, I'm just really like devastated and just left with nothing else to do. I'm cornered. I'm cornered here and it's just like, ah! And so yeah, there you go. Aha. <laughs> Tran. Zishin, have you given this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? You're the best, you're the best. What should I review next? Hit the like if you like. Please subscribe and please don't cry. Hit the bell as well. Over here next to my head, it's another video that you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, Lingua Ignota, uh, forever.